Rhodesian man is a fossil that Hoven mentions, but doesn't say much about. This fossil was discovered in 1921 in the country that was then known as Rhodesia, in a district that is now part of Zambia, a district called Kabwe. It consists of a single skull, together with a collection of other bones which may be from the same individual. They date to around two or three hundred thousand years old. The finds are now commonly referred to as the Kabwe skull or Kabwe remains. It's not very clear which species the skull belongs to, though it is rather robust and is probably a Homo heidelbergensis. Rainer Proch von Seiten is a German anthropologist who has caught faking results of carbon-14 dating tests for human fossils. His case is another great example of how science roots out and corrects faults in its consistent search for the truth. Proch lied about pretty much everything in his work, from the dating and origin of a range of fossils that he'd worked on, right up to his name, the von Seiten, it turns out, was completely fabricated in an attempt to seem to be descended from nobility. Proch's frauds were mainly designed to put forward the notion that modern humans and Neanderthals were much more closely linked than is in fact the case. His contributions had some effect on the scientific opinion for several decades, though science is a self-correcting process which has now managed to expunge the false data from the modern theories. And we're back to previously understood situation that modern humans and Neanderthals were not closely linked. Professor Chris Stringer of London's Natural History Museum is quoted as saying that Proch's contributions were of negligible significance to the recent debate. He also says that Proch had a low reputation in the field. This is quotes taken from personal communication listed in the Skeptics Dictionary website. Werner Proch was suspended from the University of Frankfurt in 2004 and was forced to retire shortly after in 2005, and frankly, good riddance. Sometimes people come along who attempt to distort the path of scientific progress with a variety of motives. Proch appears to be the worst kind, someone who attempts to sabotage science from within. But fortunately, science insists on peer review and duplication of experimental results, and it was this fact-checking that eventually caught him out. The Latoli footprints are a wonderfully fortunate find, consisting of a series of tracks made by our hominid ancestors roughly 3.5 to 3.7 million years ago, which have been preserved, fortunately, in a layer of cemented volcanic ash. Reconstruction of the individuals who made the tracks, based on their foot size and step length, suggests that one was around 150 centimetres or 5 feet tall, and the other was around 20 centimetres or 8 inches shorter than this. They were clearly walking bipedally, rather like modern humans. In fact, Hovind's claim is that the footprints were from modern humans, though this is disproved by dating the sediment in which they're found. The Leitoli area in Tanzania has also turned up other finds, including tracks of a great many other creatures. In the nearby area, fossil remains from around 13 unique Australopithecus afarensis individuals have been found, including some in the same sediment layer as the footprints. This is the same species as the Lucy skeleton mentioned in an earlier slide. The find of fossils nearby further strengthens the claim that the Letoli footprints were made by members of this species. Java Man is another example of a single fossilised skull fragment which Hovind attempts to discredit with spurious arguments. Most of these come from the claims of Eugène Dubois, the Dutch physician who found the skull. Allegedly, Dubois also found two other undoubtedly human skulls very nearby, some sources say 20 feet away, and failed to tell anyone about them for 30 years. This is, of course, completely untrue. Dubois published articles about these two other skulls in 1890 and 1892. The Java Man skull was found in 1891, in other words, right at the same time. Also, these two other skulls weren't found 20 feet away, but 65 miles away. So, yet another example of a completely insane lie from the pen of Kent Hovind. Hovind also says that Dubois claimed that Java Man was probably just a species of ape, such as a giant gibbon. This is another example of a claim that's so crazy that even the arch-creationist organisation Answers in Genesis says people should never use it. Needless to say, Java Man bears no resemblance to a gibbon at all, and the argument is ridiculous. Almost all the skulls so far discovered, even those ranging back several million years, have cranial capacities, that's the bit you put the brain in, far larger than that of any living ape, yet with striking anatomical differences from modern humans, especially in the skull. OK, so by chance you could have found a few freaks with genetic diseases, but the chance of every single fossilised ancestor being heavily diseased and not one single healthy specimen being found seems, well, crazy. Peking Man is another example of a group of fossil specimens from a species known as Sinanthropus, or Chinese Man. The find consists of 15 partial craniums, 11 lower jaws, many teeth, some bones and a number of stone tools. They date to between 300,000 and 500,000 years old and were discovered in a site near Beijing, formerly Peking, hence the name, in China, between 1929 and 1937. 
Yet again, Hovind claims that this extraordinary find was probably just a modern ape. Again, this comparison falls down at every hurdle. The cranial capacity, the brain size, is twice that of a large gorilla, and the skulls are morphologically very different, as shown by the image on this slide. The consensus view among experts is that Peking man is an example of Homo erectus, and fits in perfectly with the currently accepted model for radiation of early hominids out of Africa. Just as the final episode of Peter Jackson's adaptations of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy was released to the big screen, a team of scientists in the island of Flores in Indonesia made a startling discovery that would amaze the world. They had found remains of real-life hobbits, miniaturised hominids who stood just over one metre or around three and a half feet tall, or roughly a foot shorter than even the shortest of the pygmy tribes in Africa. This island species, if that is indeed what the remains turn out to show, is of minor importance to the story of human origins. Remarkably, they may have lived up to 12,000 years ago, so overlapped with the very beginnings of human civilization. It's possible that their diminutive size is a result of insular dwarfism, a phenomenon well understood in other animals evolving on small islands, leading to such creatures as the dwarf elephants which lived on the Mediterranean island of Crete until around 11,000 years ago. Hovind's suggestion that the so-called hobbits were perhaps just normal human beings with some kind of genetic dwarfism is plausible but unlikely. They may have had a condition called Laron syndrome, but this certainly isn't a strong hypothesis and it isn't required to explain their size. Evolution is well known to produce such effects. There isn't a complete consensus, but most anthropologists and paleontologists believe Homo floresiensis to be a separate species, not just a pathologically small Homo sapiens. So, to summarise the arguments that I've made in this presentation, there are probably two main points. Firstly, we actually have a very large number of fossils, showing the evolution of the hominid lineage from before the split of the ancestors of modern chimpanzees and humans six or seven million years ago, right up to the present day. Secondly, as we've seen several times, there have been frauds in the past. But this is irrelevant. The fact that scientists have sometimes been wrong does not have any bearing on whether they're wrong now. If you think that the current classifications are wrong, then critique them specifically. If anything, being embarrassed in the past by mistaken identification makes modern scientists far more careful. Also, we now have dating methods which would have immediately exposed the frauds of the past as such. Well, that's all for now. As ever, there's loads more information on my website at frame.net, where you can also find a transcript of this talk and all the following ones and all the previous ones. And you can keep up to date with my blog as well as learning about some of my other work. See you next time when I'll be talking about the science of archaeology and how it tells us all these secrets about the past. Thanks for listening.